Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Chaim Sperber and Boaz Cohen for uh, setting up this wonderful conference, and they've created already a great tradition of international conferences, and I hope that uh, they will be able to continue this for many years in the future, and I hope that I will be able to participate as well. Since we're uh, marking time since the appearance of Gretz's uh, History of the Jews, I, I have to say here that uh, regarding East European Jewry, this was where uh, East European historians of his time, what Shmuel Feiner is called the second school of Jewish historiography, have fe felt that this was the place where the great master, as they called him, uh, missed the mark. The Hebrew translators of Gretz in a great Eastern European Jewish tradition have, they say, farteicht und farbessert. In other words, they translated and improved uh, the great master's history. And there's a very interesting uh, interplay of translation and also subversion of Gretz's original text in the Hebrew translations, adaptations of his work. But that's the topic for another lecture, which I'm not going to give today. Uh, with apologies to Pirandello, I called this Six Narratives in Search of a Historian. I'd like to offer some uh, reflections, uh, memories, and analysis of what has happened in the study and writing of Polish Jewish history over the past four decades in which I've been active uh, in the field. But just in sum, we can say that we're witness to great changes, both in the approach and in the writing of the history of the Jews of Poland. Get this? There we go. Uh, using a version uh, of the classic journalist questions of the who, what, where, and how, uh, I'd like to talk, at least in brief, about uh, where we have been, what was the writing of Polish Jewish history like up until the present generation or generations, where we are at the present, and who we are, because I think the uh, how should I say, the identity of those writing and where they are writing is also something very, very important and significant about the writing of Polish Jewish history in our time, and uh, where we might be going and where we should be going uh, in the writing. Since I said I've been active in this field for quite a few decades, uh, permit me to use one of my own publications as a kind of marker as to the, ch the point of transition in the field. The book that I wrote together with Gershon Hundert, my dear colleague and friend, in 1984, it appeared, uh, The Jews in Poland and Russia, Bibliographical Essays, was an attempt to sum up the field as it existed at that time. And first of all, I can say that in 1984, it was possible to do that within the cover. Today, we wouldn't even publish a book. We'd put something online. Uh, but this was the end of the kind of pre-computer era in many ways. But uh, we tried to sum up several generations up to that point of what had been done in the writing of uh, Polish Jewish history and Russian Jewish history together in one book. In a sense, to sum up the work of the great founders of the discipline, people like uh, Dubnov, uh, Balaban, and others from the generation, and also what we heard in the first lecture, that kind of missing interwar generation. We don't know what would have happened if these people, most of them, I assume, would tragically died in the Holocaust. Uh, what kind of discipline of writing the history of the Jews of Poland would have developed into had they uh, not been lost in the Holocaust? But how are we different? How is the present? I'm using my presentation as basically a presentation of book covers as a kind of good markers as to what's happening uh, in the field over different uh, decades. First of all, one obvious feature of the present generation, generations of people dealing with Polish Jewish history, is this is a real, true international conversation with several major centers, something that didn't exist. When I was a graduate student, and I should have said this with the previous slide, uh, I was pretty lonely. You could have fit the number of doctoral students uh, in the time when there were still phone booths. They don't, don't exist anymore, but at the time when there were phone booths, you could have fit, it, fit practically everyone writing doctoral dissertations on Polish Jewish history within the confines of one phone booth, not even two. Uh, when I made my first trip to Poland in 1972, together with Gershon Hundert and a late colleague, Arnie Scribner, uh, who unfortunately did not live to finish his dissertation, uh, we were just about it. 
uh, people working on dissertations. There were a few older people in Israel, people in their 50s and 60s at the time, who were writing dissertations mm -hmm. about Polish Jewish history. But that was about it at the time. And today we have a real international conversation with a lively center in Poland, here in Israel, North America, also in Germany. And we have kind of flagship uh, periodicals for the discipline, uh, with four, no less. I mean, I couldn't have dreamt such a thing would have existed uh, when I started my graduate school uh, career. Another part, which I think is also, I'm beginning to appreciate it more and more over the years, is what we owe to a small but influential group of people who left Poland in the wake of the so-called anti-Zionist purge in 1968. And this included both Jewish scholars and non-Jewish scholars who left Poland at that time and came here to Israel and to North America. Among them, I mentioned here on the slide, Lucian Dobroszycki, Yaakov Goldberg, and my dear teacher, Professor Andrzej Kaminski. Uh, if I had to sum up what they did, they made for us a live connection with what remained of some tradition of writing Polish Jewish history in Poland and also they sent us both literally and figuratively to the archives. That they provided us both with the will and the skills for dealing with archival material uh, when we made our way to Poland, but also working in archives here in Israel and in the States. But the skills and the interest and the questions they provided for us uh, were crucial. Another part of what I call the calling card of the present generation of scholars on Polish Jewry is, first of all, it's a new generation. This is a generation that did not grow up in interwar Poland. Uh, and also, the generation of Polish scholars who are writing on Jewish topics. As I said here, there's the generation that knew not Poland, that is, the Jewish scholars, and the generation that knew not Jews, and that is the Polish scholars who did not live in Poland when there was a live and large Jewish community uh, in that land. And part of it was the very exposure to being in Poland. Professor Chona Schmeruk led what have become some legendary tours of graduate students to Poland in the 1980s, which provided a kind of turning point in the minds of several of these people. David Asaf from Tel Aviv University says this explicitly, that that visit to Poland really changed his whole view about many, many things in his academic career. And another thing which I think is crucial in our writing of history is that history writing is no longer part of the political debate which went on in interwar Polish Jewry, and even some of the dissertations that were written here in Israel in the 60s and early 70s still reflected that debate. But now that, that debate is over, uh, for better or for worse, but, but it's over. And another thing which I didn't mention on the slide, which is clearly of ultimate significance, is the end of the communist regime in Poland and other countries in Eastern Europe, which not only opened up the archives, but opened up the whole historical discipline to new approaches, uh, for better or for worse, but it opened it up uh, after the confines of the Marxist kind of historiography that went on in a communist Poland. Now, I said we've changed, but where did we start from? So if we talk about the kind of basic narratives of Polish Jewish history which developed from the 19th, from the very beginning of the writing of Polish Jewish history in the 19th century, both by Poles and by Jews, uh, there are some kind of basic narratives. First of all, what is central to all discussion of modern Jewish history, there's no way to escape it, is the emancipation narrative. But in Poland, we have two variants of that narrative, and it's a kind of teleological narrative where history works toward a certain goal. Uh, either the emancipation leading to assimilationist narrative, where Jews will become absorbed into the Polish nation, or the emancipation national Jewish narrative, which is well reflected in the interwar period, where history leads to another goal, that is the Jews organizing as a national group, a modern national group within uh, a Polish state. And here we have to say that history, 
as was true of Polish history in general in the 19th century and in the interwar period, uh, history also has a political aspect to it. That it's no less prescriptive than it is descriptive. Uh, and we can't get away from that when we look at the works that were done at the time. There also are some apologetic aspects of Polish Jewish history writing where Jews are active participants in the Polish national struggle and the so-called contribution narrative. Shula, you wanted to say something? Could you just go back on slide because I don't understand something. Sure. And the political debate among historians, could you just... Yeah, in other words, that you wanted to prove, you know, it's mostly the Zionist narrative versus what we could call for short, the Buddhist narrative. Uh, and there's an argument between the two, or we add a third, the so-called assimilationist narrative. What is the correct view of where Polish history has been and where it's going? That's what I said, that kind of political debate. We might call it a kind of chip on the shoulder historiography, uh, and thankfully we're past that. We have our own hangups, but we're past that at least. Uh, all right. And another thing regarding the interwar period, which is the main field of my uh, scholarly interest, but not the only one, uh, Polish Jewish history is presented as a, basically a political story. That there's a, a national community that's fighting for its rights, and the word fight and struggle and even war are used in the title of the works which I have here uh, on the slide, Miutli Umi Lochem, in the middle of Moshe Landau, a, a fighting national minority, and on the right and on the left, it's the mil mavak, mil chama, you know, you have struggle, war. This is heavy stuff. And that's the way they looked at these kind of things. But it's also total politics, the politi cradle to grave politics. From the kindergarten you sent your kid to, to the loan bank where you took a loan from, to a sick fund, to everything was somehow under the aegis of a political party. And that's the way. Polish Jewish history was presented in a sense, a political and a totally political story. Now, how, is, how have things changed? First of all, there's been a kind of mid-course correct correction, we could call it. We are correcting and widening those older narratives. Because first of all, even the discussion of politics was limited. In a sense, it was mostly focused on the Zionist party. So you have work, my own, about Agudat Yisrael, the Orthodox party, the non-Zionist, and about the Bund, and also about even the Mizrahi, the religious Zionist party, written by my student, Asaf Kaniel, uh, we've widened the narrative. First of all, to look at the entire spectrum. The, the last kind of missing piece, uh, which is provided somewhat, is the whole question of Jews and communism and in the Communist Party, which is still kind of touchy even post-communist Poland, but nevertheless there, have been some, there has been some serious work on this. So the first thing is a simple widening of the narrative, a more inclusive narrative. But another thing is to first of all get away from this totality of politics narrative. That there is cradle to grave politics. That indeed exists. I'm not denying that it exists. But politics is not everything. That first of all we look at long-term processes, including the very nature of development of politics. Scott Uri published his book, Barricades and Banners, where he talks about the very development of Jewish politics. It's not something that's assumed, but it developed, and how did it develop? But also uh, secularization, which is a topic which needs more development. I have here the doctoral dissertation of Daniel Rosenthal, who's sitting here. We're dealing with attitudes toward death and the development of the what we call funeral parlor industry in Poland. Uh, but a fascinating combination of all kinds of disciplines. Uh, so looking at these things and also looking at assimilation. There are assimilationists, but there's also assimilation. And look at that process. And that's something which has been the subject in the last generation of new work. If I had to say what is our goal, or what, what is our methodology, it's what I wrote here on the slide. It's a question of context. And that is first to make the Jews part of Poland. That it's not a separate, closed off story. There is policy towards the Jews, but there's also a Jewish policy towards being in Poland. There is a certain act of mutuality. And as I talk about Jews and other Poles, as Gershon Hundert used that very felicitous phrase based on Peter Gay, who wrote about Jews and Germans, but it's making it part of a larger whole. 
and also to make Jewish history part of general history, both in its subjects, its tools, its approaches. Uh, it's not no longer okay, a kind of catch-up game. You're trying to use the best tools, the cutting-edge methodologies uh, in writing the history of the Jews, and particularly in this case, the history of the Jews of Poland, that also a kind of self-knowledge that this is all part of the approaches in history in general in the past generation, our own self-awareness, the whole question of objectivity, and the special challenges of the present era where the writing of the history of Poland, no less than the writing of the history of Polish Jews, is something that's in flux. It's also part of an argument, both political and social, in Poland today, and whether we like it or not, those of us dealing with history of the Jews in Poland are part of this discussion, uh, for better or for worse, but I think in, generally, in general it's for the better. And I use here the book of uh, Pablo Macheco about the Frankist movement, which it has been already the subject of much scholarly interest, but nevertheless, his approach is among the best examples of the history writing that's going on today in dealing with Polish Jewish uh, history. Now, one of our challenges is dealing with stereotypes, a lot of different stereotypes, for better or for worse again. First of all, there's the contrasting images of Polish Jewry itself. So on the right, on the bottom, we have Roman Vishniak's famous book of photographs, where mostly the Jews are traditional Jews, Orthodox Jews. But on the other hand, we, somebody mentioned Hakoach Wien. So here you have the Hakoach Pinsk. Uh, this is a poster for a football match. Uh, in the 1930s, a match between uh, Maccabi Baranovich and Hakoach Pinsk, uh, which is not exactly the way we usually think about Polish Jewry, but this is also part of the story. What we want to do the best we can is to present the multilingual, which is also important. We're talking about creativity in three languages. Just a list of the periodicals published, and we have an incomplete list, uh, of the periodicals that appeared in Polish Jewry in the interwar period is more than a thousand items. And this is an incomplete uh, list. And unfortunately, many of these periodicals, we just have the title. We don't have a single issue which has survived from these periodicals. But this is something that we're just beginning to get into. And of course, there are, there are issues of cultural stereotypes, Polishness. Here in Israel, I've had to deal with this uh, many times. There is a kind of cultural stereotype of what they call Polaniut, Polishness, which is a very specific kind of Jews from Poland, from a very specific cultural milieu, uh, which is not the same as what Americans know about, you know, say, Polish jokes or the Jewish mother. Uh, there is a certain kind of stereotype. If I had time, I would show you a classic skit from a Israeli television show called Zehu Zeh, which was popular many years ago, where they had this group of three men dressed up as women called the Polaniot, and they would carry out this kind of Polishness. So, but we have to get beyond that stereotype and try and talk about the real Polish Jews. And then, of course, there are images of Poland and the Pole, which I don't uh, make light of, the whole issue of the question of anti-Semitism uh, and Polish anti-Semitism. Now, we said before that one of the things we did was get to the archives. This is something that really Balaban could have done, Shipper, anyone at the Jagiellonian University could have just walked into the Czartoryski Library, which is in the same city, uh, but you had to want to do that. You had to ask certain questions about it. So my dear colleague Moshe Rosman first went into the archives to talk about the relations of the nobles and the Poles, which, which is part of a whole stereotypical view of the relations between the Jews and the so-called Poritz, the Polish noblemen. But he tried to see what was the real relationship based on the archival documents. And one of the side effects, the kind of uh, serendipitous uh, products, was his discovering historical mentions of Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism. Uh, Going to the archives has changed our views in many ways. So here are two other scholars, Marcin Wojcinski and Glenn Diner, one from Poland, one from the United States, also have gone to the archives to correct many of these kind of stereotypes uh, from the older historical literature, whether it be the attitude toward Hasidism, where Wojcinski shows many times that the attitude of the Polish authorities was indeed very positive or neutral toward Hasidism, 
or Glenn Diner, we talked about the stereotype of the Jewish uh, participant in the Polish uprisings against Russian rule, where Glenn Diner in his latest book, Yankel's Tavern, brings just as many examples of Jewish so-called collaborators with the Russian regime who even asked for a reward after the rebellion being put down, they said, ask for a reward. I was loyal, give me a tavern, let me lease a tavern, and things like that. So the archives have opened up all kinds of possibilities. Another important thing of the last generation were new voices in Polish historiography. I used the example of the late Professor Jerzy Tomaszewski as the kind of pioneer and finest example of this, where, he, where the whole attitude toward Poland is different the minute you start dealing with Jews. So he has, just from the title of his book, the one in the middle and the one on the right, you have a multinational republic, and the fatherland is not just Poles. Just the titles tell you that this is a declaration of a very, very different view of Poland and Polish history from what was common up until that time. And of course, one of the most controversial, but I think productive debates in the recent years is the debates around the books of Professor Jan Gross from Princeton University uh, dealing with questions, very, very difficult questions of Polish collaboration or even participation in the killing of Jews during the Holocaust and then plundering their property afterwards. His book, uh, Neighbors, which originally appeared in Polish, then in English and many other languages, also Hebrew, and this has ignited a great debate uh, some of it in the kind of, how shall I put it, jungle of the internet where you can find fine, polite historical discussion and gutter level anti-Semitism and everything in between, but it's a very, very rich literature for good or for bad. Uh, the question of Polish anti-Semitism finally has been treated in a kind of systematic uh, scholarly manner with all kinds of things. Just looking at the title of the books tells you already. Poland's Threatening Other by Joanna Michlitz. On the other hand, Robert Blaubaum's edited volume, Anti-Semitism and Its Opponents in Modern Poland. That already sets you back for a second. Wait a minute, there are opponents? And indeed, there were opponents to anti-Semitism in Poland. And the book of Yisrael Bartal and Magdalena Opalski, uh, Poles and Jews of Failed Brotherhood a literary study, but with many historical implications. And I have there on the slide even the uh, emblem of the town of Kolbuszowa, which is in southeastern Poland, which I think is something unique anywhere, where you have the two hands shaking with the cross and the Star of David. And this is taken, by the way, from the website of the town from today, uh, when I don't think there's a single Jew in the town now, but this is part of the symbol, this notion of some kind of harmony in the relations between the two. Um, now, dealing with the Holocaust period, I'll just take one minute to talk about this because I could give a whole lecture about this. The most important thing is, first of all, the Holocaust is not the whole story of Polish Jewry, that's for sure. And to avoid a kind of backshadowing where the first kind of Polish teenager who throws a stone at a Jew in Krakow in the 13th century, this is the beginning of the road to Auschwitz. So we don't want that kind of uh, historiography. But on the other hand, we don't want to detach the Holocaust from the previous period. And in my own work, in my arguments with my colleagues who are Holocaust historians, I'm always pointing out, you can't understand how Polish Jews behaved during the Holocaust if you don't understand what happened in the years prior to it. It seemed obvious, but uh, it's something that had to be taught and to be learned. And I think there's also a more sober view of Polish-Jewish relations looking at the high points and low points of those relationships. And here we can commend the book, for example, of Chabi Dreyfus, uh, Anu Yehudei Polin, uh, We Polish Jews, with a question mark, and the attitude of Polish Jews toward Poland and Poles during the war. Uh, what happened? What did I do? There we go. Uh, now, not everything that has happened in the past gener uh, generation of scholarship is to my taste. And, a particularly glaring change, which has not been for the better, is the missing link now of the so-called golden age of Polish Jewry, what had been the focus of the writing of Polish Jewish history, namely the time when Polish Jewry was the center of the Jewish world, culturally, religiously, etc., in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. There's almost no scholarship on this period now. 
Now, I know that there are great challenges, linguistic and others, dealing with rabbinic sources, Latin sources, going to the archives, but I'm really sorry about this, and I always try to interest students in working in this period, but almost nobody wants to work in the period now. Uh, and even some of my colleagues or professors who had been working in the period have now moved on to other periods. So almost nobody is working on this uh, field now, which is to my sorrow. Uh, another area where we, there has been interesting work is dealing with the younger generation in interwar Poland, looking at a kind of generational study. There have been some interesting doctoral dissertations, articles, looking at the younger generation in this period, many times based on the group of autobiographies that were submitted to the YIVO competitions in the 1930s. And as we heard several times today already, another area which is beginning to get research, important research, is issues of gender and women's history. Besides my colleague, Professor Moshe Rossman, there have been many other scholars dealing with these issues recently. And another thing is what we could call history from below. So, uh, and how it affects the narrative. In Poland today, there are a lot of amateur and semi uh, professional historians who work on the local level who have written about their local Jewish community. Somebody has to come and synthesize, put together this kind of work, but it's already there in the, in the field. And you can even have the book of Karen Auerbach where dealing with post-war Polish Jewry, she talks about one building in Warsaw and the inhabitants of one apartment building as a kind of example of what happened to Polish Jews after the war. And this is kind of very, very local history from below at its best. And of course, another area where we need work, it's just beginning seriously, is the Jews in communist Poland. Uh, I don't have time to show you this, but now look on the internet. Uh, one of the things is to give a kind of color to history. So we have a kind of home movie taken by a tourist in Warsaw in the summer of 1939. You can find it on YouTube, several different versions, Jewish Quarter of Warsaw, 1939. One of the addresses is written here, but it's there and it's in color. Uh, and you just see a typical Jewish street courtyard in Warsaw uh, on the eve of the war and it's worth uh, looking at. Now, one of the things we have today is of course the internet. And here, I say there's a certain challenge in dealing with old sources. Whether it be the Jewish press, which I always say I wish I had this kind of access when I was writing my own dissertation, instead of sitting there with the newspapers or the microfilms in Evo in New York and ruining my eyesight, uh, it's available now. Heint and Moment, the major Yiddish papers, the Yiddish dailies of Warsaw are available online. So now I say to the students, you have no excuse now. You don't have to go to New York, you don't have to go to Warsaw. The newspapers, are there. you can look at them from home, you don't even have to be when the library is open. Uh, it's there, but it's a challenge now. You have no excuse, but it's worth uh, exploring. The same thing is true even with something as basic as the Polish census data from 1921 and 1931, which is kind of basic material for anyone dealing with the interwar period. Uh, we have no excuse. Just a few years ago, when I was a visiting professor at Yale and I wanted to use this material, the Yale Library had it, of course. That didn't surprise me. They said it's not in the main library. It's in this warehouse a kilometer away from the campus. And so I went there and I had the books. By the time I came home that day, I was covered with dust from head to toe. These books hadn't been touched in 50 years. Uh, now, from the comfort of one's own home, but it's also a challenge sense that you can't, you don't have to rely anymore on what Bronstein or Mahler or other people did about interwar, you have to go back to the material yourself uh, to make your own analysis or to check up at least on their analysis and to ask your own questions. For example, the gender question, the material is there, but somebody has to ask the question about it. So when I published years ago an article about Jewish women interwar Poland, I talked about uh, Jewish women as university students. Material is all there, but no one had bothered to ask the question or analyze what's the difference between male and female students, just to give an example. Uh, and here, I'm working, I'm working toward the end. I'm almost at the end now, if you wanted to make a signal that I'm at the end of my time. Okay. Uh, we're working towards a new synthesis. And one of the major projects which I am proud to have been associated with also was the YIVO uh, Encyclopedia, which gathered together over 400 scholars writing the articles for the two volumes, it's now it's online, it's free, uh, and it's also much expanded because there's also uh, uh, access to archival material, to pictures, to videos, 
uh, all connected to this, but it was an attempt to say something about East European Jewish history. Uh, where, do we, where do we stand in dealing with it today? Uh, and therefore, it's, it's a very important piece of work which is towards a new synthesis. And the same thing is true with various books uh, and collaborative projects which are made about the history of the Jews in Eastern Europe, whether it be Gershon Hundert's fine book about Polish Jews in the 18th century, or Antony Polonsky's massive three volumes now s summarized in one volume about the Jews in Poland and Russia, uh, or I'm proud to be connected also to the both the ones in the middle, the course of the Open University of Israel entitled Pauline, where you had specialists in each field writing the different units on it, trying to summarize the best attitudes in research and approaches in research to that time. That was written in the 90s. Or the two volumes of Kiyum Vashever, uh, which is also kind of multi-generational and also multi or international uh, group of essays summing up the history of the Jews of Poland and their culture over the generations. As I reach the end of my presentation today, and I could have said a lot more, but I'll suffice with this, uh, one of the things, there's a kind of locus, I think, uh, at least psychologically, if not geographically and physically, and that's in the new museum, which opened in Warsaw only a few months ago, the Museum of the History of the Polish Jews, which is called Polin. They even call it that, even Polish. Uh, and Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet uh, has been following this and lived in Warsaw for many years, shepherding this project along. Uh, it's it also caused a kind of re rethinking about how do we sum up, and you can even take a virtual tour of the museum if you can't get there. Uh, you can take a virtual tour of the different galleries to see how they presented the whole history of Polish Jews. And this has created a kind of ongoing international conversation I put here on the slide that next week in Jerusalem, there's a meeting between Professor Dario Stola, who is the new director of the museum, and Yisrael Bartal, who are speaking about issues raised by the museum uh, and what are its implications for the study of Polish Jewish history. And uh, Professor Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimbel, I should have mentioned, already in the 1970s, together with Lucian Dobrzycki, published a book of photographs called Image Before My Eyes, which in many ways changed the view of many people in Polish Jewry, where they tried to show Polish Jews of all different types, all different varieties. And that also was a kind of eye-opener for many people who had grown up on the kind of stereotypical images, whether of Abraham Joshua Heschel's The Earth is the Lord's, uh, or pictures of Roman Vishniak. This was not all of Polish Jewry. Uh, and unfortunately, there's issues, political and social, still going on in Poland, where sometimes some stereotypes uh, still might exist. There's some kind of interesting, I always like kind of interesting uh, anti-Semitic, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a weird hobby of mine to collect these things, but the kind of connection, for example, between Jews, communism, and homosexuality, for example, the one on the lower right, uh, kind of uh, attack of the Judo Komuna, the kind of Jewish communist plot which also already includes a homosexuality. Uh, or the poster on the left from a soccer stadium where it says, uh, death to the hook-nosed, where they, this is a kind of uh, nickname they give to an opposing team. They call them the Jews or the hook-nosed. So and also the one in the middle was uh, actually an advertisement from the 1920s for an anti-Semitic organization called Rosvui, uh, where you can see the kind of Jewish rats running away, being chased. Uh, and this was published by mistake uh, in a uh, business directory only a couple of years ago in Warsaw, where they wanted to publish some old advertisements from old phone books and things from the 1920s. And somehow that one slipped through uh, the editors. Uh, so there are some kind of challenges and stereotypes that might still exist. But if I had to sum up, I would say that looking back over my own career and that of my students and colleagues, uh, Polish Jewish history uh, and the research on it has had an honorable past. It has an impressive present, and I think the history of Polish Jews also has a great future. Thank you very much.